sorry about that there, year seven. Got a little bit carried away with myself. Um, we are looking at the gunpowder plot, so the music seemed appropriate. Um, fire starter, little fire starter that Guy Fawkes was. Um, remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. So you might have heard these very famous words before in relation to the gunpowder plot. They're taken from a poem written by somebody called John Milton and the poem is called In Quintum Novembris. So moving on to exactly what we're going to be focusing on today. Obviously in last lesson you looked at James I's problems in general to do with religion and they were plentiful but I wouldn't necessarily say religion was the biggest problem he had. However, the gunpowder plot could have been potentially really serious. The question that we mainly want you to focus on today is the gunpowder plot, what really happened? So I'd like you to copy that down as your title, please. Underline it, put the date as well. The traditional story that we're told is quite well known, that Guy Fawkes and a number of other individuals attempted to blow up the House of Lords. But how true is that? Hopefully you're going to decide for yourselves during this lesson. So the learning objectives of this lesson are to identify the main events of 1605 and the gunpowder plot, to deconstruct the myth. That really means to break down the traditional story and, you know, think about did it even happen really? Um, so really be quite analytical with the traditional story, kind of try and pull it to pieces um, and see whether or not you think it happened in the way we're told it did. So who was involved? How many conspirators were there? Would we even class it as a conspiracy? Did it even happen? These are all questions which hopefully um, you'll have answered at least in some part by the end of this lesson. So... Um, it was something that triggered a popular uprising. There were 13 conspirators involved. It was a terrorist plot on an unprecedented scale. They wanted to try and wipe out Parliament, wipe out the King and the whole establishment. Um, but was it really a Catholic conspiracy or was it a myth created by the King and the government of the time? So hopefully by the end of this lesson you'll have considered that. You'll also be considering whether the men involved, um, including Guy Fawkes, can be regarded as terrorists or not. So that's something I want you to think about later on in the lesson. For now, what I want you to do, please, is to watch the following short video clips and create some form of spider diagram or notes within your book on who, what, why, where, when and how. So that's why that spider diagram's there up on the screen to give you an idea of how you could set out your notes. Don't get too excited about the videos. They're only about two, two and a half minutes long each. I really do want you to get as much information written down as you possibly can during this time because you'll be able to use it later on in the lesson when you are kind of telling your story of the gunpowder plot or telling your version of events and then also when you're trying to pull it to pieces. So make a note of anything that seems a bit suspicious, a bit unlikely, that might discredit the traditional story. So pause me now if you need to and draw a spider diagram in your books or write the side head in the gunpowder plot. Get as much information as you can because it'll help you later on. And here are the videos. Slimy Stewarts Everyone knows that Guy Fawkes tried to blow up Parliament on November the 5th. But did you know that he was just one member of a much bigger gang? In fact, there were 13 of them all together. Come on, folks. You couldn't have done this alone. Who was in your gang? I'll never tell you. Oh, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? No, you don't laugh, I laugh. It was the plot that seemed unthinkable. Fox is the explosives expert. So we're going to blow up King James and his entire family at the state opening of Parliament? That's right. Any reason or just for fun? 
John Wright is the persuader. Because you're a Catholic and I'm a Catholic and the king hates Catholics. He seems to think we're always plotting something. As if. <laughs> it was the plot that sounded impossible. Robert Catesby is the brains. So we're just supposed to roll 36 barrels of gunpowder down the Thames, sneak it into this rented cellar, wait for Parliament to open, then I creep back in, light the fuse, run away and blow up the King, and all without getting caught? Yes. OK, just checking I had that down right. It was the plot that would surely go wrong. So I persuaded 12 guys all together. That ought to do it, don't you think? You think we need one more? Nerd. I'll get one more. Um, excuse me. Would you like to be in a plot to blow up Parliament? Oh, yes, why not? Uh, but I'll just check my diary. Uh, when were you thinking? November the 5th? Yeah, I'm free. Fabulous. Well, that's 13 then. Oh, isn't 13 an unlucky number? Oh, don't worry. I'm sure it'll go off without a hitch. Francis Tresham is the idiot. Hang on. My brother in law is doing Parliament on November the 5th. I'll just send him a quick letter telling him to take the day off. I'm sure you won't tell anyone. It was the plot. Three, two, one. That went wrong. Oh. Horribly, horribly wrong. Foxes 13. What letter? What idiot sent a letter? Oh. Failing to explode on November 5th, 1605. You're going to be hung, drawn, and quartered. Gutted. This infamous tale features a king, a shed load of gunpowder, and a great excuse for fireworks every year. Now, are you sitting comfortably? I'll begin. When James I became king, English Catholics thought they might be allowed to worship freely. Now, this isn't too wild a thought, as both his wife and her mother were Catholics. Sadly, for the English Catholics, and no doubt a little disappointingly for his wife and mother-in-law, James announced his utter detestation of Catholicism. And I find anyone who didn't attend the Church of England. So, a group of Catholic plotters decided to blow the King up and take the Houses of Parliament with him. First, they tried to dig a tunnel from a nearby house, but this failed, so undeterred, they rented a cellar beneath the House of Lords, and one of them, Guy Fawkes, bought a tonne and a half of gunpowder. Ten days before Parliament was going to meet, Lord Monteagle got an anonymous letter warning him not to go. It said, They shall receive a terrible blow, this Parliament, and yet they shall not see who hurts them. Monteagle showed it to the King. So, on the night of the 4th of November, 1605, Guy Fawkes was caught red-handed with matches and gunpowder beneath the Houses of Parliament. It's a fair cop. He and his accomplices were hung, drawn and quartered. This story is a little suspicious as no tunnel has ever been found and all the evidence came from torture. It's amazing what you'll admit to when you're screaming in pain. Yes, yes, it was me, I did it. Also, only the government could sell gunpowder, so some people think that it encouraged the plot so it could persecute Catholics. What we do know is that after the plot, Catholics weren't allowed to be lawyers, vote or serve as officers in the army and navy. Today, people remember the plot with fireworks and bonfires, and they burn an effigy of Guy Fawkes on the fire. Welcome back. You should hopefully, from watching those two videos, have compiled some decent notes. And you should have picked up, if not already, that there were 13 men involved in the plot. You were also given some key names, such as John Wright, Robert Catesby, Francis Tresham. Hopefully you got some of those down. They collected 36 barrels of gunpowder in a cellar they rented underneath the Houses of Parliament. Francis Tresham, we believe, we think it was him, sent a letter to his relative in the government, Lord Monteagle, um, warning him not to go to the House of Lords on the 5th of November. He said there would be a terrible blow. That was the words that he used in the letter he sent. Um, you were told that the conspirators were hung, drawn and quartered and were made an example of by the government after their attempt to blow up the Houses of Parliament. Um, Catholics were treated harshly. 
by the government afterwards. They were not allowed to become lawyers or serve as officers. They were not allowed to vote. There are a few things that are a little bit suspicious that were mentioned on the video clip, which we're going to look at in more detail later on, um, such as no tunnel has ever actually been found um, to have been dug underneath the Houses of Parliament. A lot of the evidence that was gathered um, about the said event, the gunpowder plot, um, was gathered from the so-called conspirators um, while they were being tortured, particularly from Guy Fawkes. So it's unlikely to be the truth um, because it's the last thing that they were able to say when they were in really quite an awful lot of pain. Um, Finally, the, only the government could sell gunpowder at this time. So you do the maths. If only the government can sell it, how did they possibly get hold of it? Were they helped by someone inside the government? Were they tricked by someone inside the government? Was the government aware all along of what was happening? Did they even encourage it, perhaps? OK, so... Um, the gunpowder plot, what really happened? You ultimately are going to be creating a piece of work which tells the traditional story of the gunpowder plot, but also deconstructs it or breaks it down um, to tell us what you think really happened. OK, so I'm going to read through quite a lot of information with you over the next sort of five, six plus PowerPoint slides. If you'd prefer to print that off um, and highlight it or underline it or whatever, rather than sit and listen to me talk through it with you, that's absolutely fine. But if you would like me to read it through with you, there might be the odd thing I say that kind of explains things in a bit more detail then that equally is fine. OK, um, so you're going to produce a piece of work which identifies or explains the main elements of the traditional story and then you're going to kind of attack it. OK, so that's why I've drawn a flow diagram um, on the PowerPoint slide and kind of arrows going towards it to sort of suggest, well, this could be wrong because or this could be wrong because. Um, so you're then going to try to come to an overall judgment as to what you think actually happened. But of course, you should support your line of argument with evidence from the information we're about to look at. You could use anything from the videos as well and from an article that we're going to look at later on in the lesson. You could produce this piece of work as a large poster if you wanted to with a flow chart that show the main events or like a story timeline um, and with arrows that question the accuracy of the traditional story. You could do it as an essay, you could do it as a mini project, as a short radio or TV program, however you would like to do it. If you email the pieces of work that you produce to me, please, I will select some finalists and Mr Henderson will judge whose piece of work is the most analytical and who kind of deconstructs the traditional story in the most detailed way. So even if you wanted to do a little bit of extra research into it, you could do if you wanted to. Um, so please make sure you email me your work. You never know, there may be a prize of some kind involved. Not entirely sure when you would get it under the current circumstances but it's worth a try um, if you're struggling with the fact that you have this freedom to kind of just do whatever you want and you're really stuck then please contact me um, via email and I would be happy to help you okay so we're going to move on in a second and I'm going to read you um, these PowerPoint slides of information to help you create that piece of work OK, so the plot itself. So this is a timeline of events. This will help you when you are creating your traditional story or version of events of the gunpowder plot. So you can see the diagram has different dates on it. They link to the information in the text. So it says here is a timeline of events surrounding the gunpowder plot from a 17th century government report. So a document from the time. It's worth remembering that this is based on the confessions of the plotters which were obtained under torture. So you really have to consider how far we might kind of believe the information that we've been told or how much the conspirators might have been coerced or forced into saying what the people torturing them wanted them to say. 
So, number one, Robert Catesby had taken part in the Earl of Essex's 1601 rebellion. Um, so, this is prior to the reign of James I. It's during Elizabeth. Um, but Robert Catesby was pardoned. In 1603, he tried unsuccessfully to persuade the King of Spain to invade England. In 1604, he returned to England, where he recruited or asked other Catholics to join him in a plot to kill James. One of these people was Guy Fawkes. The group planned to blow up the House of Lords when King James came to open Parliament on the 5th of November. At first they tried to dig a tunnel from a nearby house. When this failed, one of the plotters, called Thomas Percy, rented a cellar underneath the House of Lords. Fawkes brought um, 36 barrels of gunpowder, on the 26th of October 1605, so this is 10 days before Parliament was due to eat, meet even, um, Lord Monteagle got an anonymous letter warning him not to go. Um, it said, they shall receive a terrible blow this Parliament and yet they shall not see who hurts them. Monteagle took it to the King. The plotters realised they were discovered but decided to carry on anyway. Now that seems a little bit implausible doesn't it um number five first of november when he first saw the letter james realized that it meant some plot of gunpowder um number six fourth of november which again is a bit of a stretch isn't it a terrible blow and suddenly oh must be related to gunpowder um number six fourth of november fawkes was caught red-handed with the gunpowder despite the fact that apparently he was aware the government were coming. Um, number uh, 7, 8th of November, the other plotters were chased to Holbeck House in Staffordshire where Catesby and Percy were killed. Francis Tresham, Lord Monteagle's brother-in-law, was arrested and sent to the Tower and he died there. Um, and Guy Fawkes kind of gave his full confession on the 9th of November. So, causes of the gunpowder plot. What caused it to happen in the first place? There was also there was always a threat of Catholicism. There was even during Elizabeth's reign, but Elizabeth managed to deal quite well with religion. She treated Protestants, Puritans, Catholics all relatively fairly um, and tried to carry on a middle way religion. And James was pretty good at doing the same. However, um, as you can see from the diagram in the centre of this um, page, the population of England in 1603 was 2.5 million, which is nothing compared to what it is now, but 2.5 million is a lot of people, and only 30,000 of those people were Catholic, so they really were quite a small minority within the country. But even though the population of Catholics living in England was very small, it doesn't mean they weren't a threat to James and the rest of the country. When Elizabeth I died in 1603, James came to the throne as James I of England. His mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, had been a Catholic. The English Catholics had great hopes that they would be able to worship more freely, but James did not live up to their expectations. James tried to be tolerant of Catholics at the start of his reign, but over time his laws against them and the taxes he made them pay caused great resentment. And this was one of the reasons, I think, that um, the plotters, if there were plotters, um, one of the reasons they chose to rise up against the government. So steps towards the gunpowder plot. In 1603, there were two small Catholic plots against James. You might remember looking at those very briefly in last lesson, the by plot and the main plot. James was scared and in February 1604, he announced his utter detestation of Catholicism. Hundreds of recusants, recusants is a key word for this lesson, um, simply means a person who refuses to submit to an authority or to comply with a regulation. So they basically refuse to worship in the way that James wanted them to worship. Instead, they decided to worship as Catholics. So hundreds of these people were rounded up and fined, so they had to pay a certain amount of money. Catholics realised that James was not going to give them freedom of worship, and that obviously made a number of them quite angry. So, 
So the impact of the gunpowder plot, what were the consequences of it? What impact did it have on anyone? The plotters were horribly executed. Even Catesby's and Percy's bodies were dug up and mutilated. You can see um, on this PowerPoint there's an image there and it says execution of the conspirators in the gunpowder plot, Old Palace Yard, Westminster, 1606. So some people um, were executed then. Um, so they served as an example of what would happen to people should anyone dare to stage a Catholic plot against the government. James and Parliament passed further measures to ensure that Catholics would not dare to try anything like this ever again. And the gunpowder plot was actually the last Catholic plot in England. So number one in terms of the impact of the events. Catholic lords with any connection to any of the plotters were re arrested, fined and ruined. And your reputation in those days was everything, really. So if you were linked to this plot in any way, no one would want to do business with you anymore or associate with you. Number two, Catholics suffered. In 1606, the Popish Recusants Act increased fines for recusants and forced Catholics to take an oath of allegiance to the king and to um the country's faith i guess they were forbidden to be lawyers vote or serve as officers in the army or navy the failure of the plot was celebrated as a wonderful deliverance parliament passed the observance of the 5th of november act 1605 also known as the thanksgiving act ordering prayers to be said and church bells to be rung to commemorate that event and we still obviously do that sorry i'm just going to get a cup of coffee because i'm getting a little bit of a dry mouth thank you um okay so england became an anti-catholic country like really seeking out catholics um and punishing them in some way number four the plot was used as protestant propaganda that means it was used as a form of advert um to attack catholics and prove that god was on the side of the protestants even today we remember guy fawkes night with bonfires and fireworks some places make an effigy that just means kind of like um a copy or a model of Guy Fawkes and they burn it on the bonfire. Be safe with fireworks, year seven. They're dangerous things. I say that from experience. Um, okay, so a little bit more information for you here, as if you don't, probably don't feel like you've had enough. Um, but all of this really is to help you come up with a clear kind of story of what happened or version of events and then be able to pick it to pieces and say well this can't be true because of this or this could be inaccurate because of this um so the catholics plot to blow up the king government on the face of it the gunpowder plot was an attempt by a group of catholics to blow up the king and houses of parliament this being the place where all of the country's laws are made in October 1605, one of the plotters gave the game away whilst trying to warn a relative who was a member of Parliament. On the 4th of November, Guy Fawkes was caught red-handed with the gunpowder just before the King was due to open Parliament. Did the government help the plot to happen? So this is a big question that historians ask. Was it actually the government who created the entire situation? The problem is, is that we only have the government side of the story because naturally history tends to be written by the powerful people at the time. Um, many of the plotters were killed immediately and the rest of our information was gathered from torture, which we know might not be that accurate. Many modern historians agree that the plot to some degree was set up by the government. When James came to the throne, he wanted to be tolerant in matters of religion. After the plot, James and the government became fiercely anti-Catholic. The suspicion is that the government encouraged the plot to give an excuse to take strong measures against the Catholics. 
there are different ways that people can oppose a government. Now you are going to be quizzed next lesson. This may well be one of the quiz questions, um, but there will be many quiz questions on this topic, so make sure you prepare for that. Um, one way of opposing or being against the government is a plot and a conspiracy. So plotting in secret to do something awful, this tactic can be used particularly when the government is so powerful and its opponents are so weak that a mass rebellion is impossible. You could rebel when large numbers of people feel angry enough to make a large scale protest and that the government is weak enough to have to listen. Or you could have a revolution where the people go to war and their government against their government, sorry, such as the civil war, um, which we're going to be looking at very soon. The gunpowder plot is an example of a plot and a conspiracy, so you could compare to modern terrorist atrocities. The plotters had no chance of persuading English Catholics to rebel and were hoping that if they destroyed the government, the King of Spain might step in and take over. Alternatively, you could see the plot of an example of a government tricking its citizens and influencing public opinion, an example of a government abusing its power and forcing the people to confess to something they perhaps didn't actually do. So they're quite different versions of events, aren't they? And you need to really think about that and come to an overall conclusion, I guess, as far as you possibly can, as to which version of events you think is true. Interpretations of the gunpowder plot then. Interpretation essentially means somebody's opinion or in point, uh, point of view. So the plot was used as Protestant propaganda to attack the Catholics and prove that God was on the side of the Protestants. Um, I think I've already told you this information to be honest. Yes, I have. Um, so there you have Guy Fawkes signature on this page. Um, and you've got a copy of it before he was tortured and then you've got a copy after torture as well. Now they're pretty different aren't they? And I would suggest somebody that's in that much of a state for that to change their handwriting that much. They must be in an incredible amount of pain and they're probably willing to confess to anything to be honest. So we have to consider how true um, Guy Fawkes' statement and some of the other conspirator statements were. So, some conspiracy theories are as follows. Some historians question whether some aspects of the story are true. We've never found um, evidence of a half-dug tunnel. Only the government could sell gunpowder. We've already talked about this. How did James realise from one obscure phrase in Lord Monteagle's letter that the plotters were going to blow up Parliament? Seems quite unlikely. Um, why was there a nine day delay between Monteagle's letter and the search which captured Guy Fawkes? Because if they were sent the letter, why did it take them so long to work out who was involved? Um, why, when they knew they were discovered, did the plotters not run away or not sort of stop the plan? Um, why? Were Catesby and Percy killed so quickly before anyone else had a chance to speak to them or before the other conspirators were found or anything? And obviously, as we've mentioned, evidence got by torture can be unreliable. Finally, many historians nowadays agree that we will never know the whole truth about the government's involvement, but admit that the plot may have been a government conspiracy. Okay, so now it's time to complete your task. So if you remember, you need to produce a piece of work which identifies or explains the main elements of the traditional story of the gunpowder plot. And then you are going to deconstruct, attack or break that traditional interpretation apart with extra pieces of information. And you should try to come to an overall judgment as well, answering the question, the gunpowder plot, what really happened? OK, and I gave you some ideas. You could do it as a large poster, as a flow chart with arrows. You could do it um, as an essay, mini project, however you wish to do it. And then that work should be emailed to me, please, Mrs. Henderson. And Mr. Henderson will have a look at it and decide which is the best piece of work and which is the most detailed or analytical. OK, so off you go.
So following this slide, you will um, see that there is an article for us to read through. Now, I'm going to read through it. You're welcome to listen to me read through it as well. But once again, if you'd prefer to just print out the information, that's absolutely fine. Here is the part of the lesson where we're considering whether Guy Fawkes and the other men involved were terrorists of their time. So the question you need to answer, which you will need to write down in your book, is to what extent were the gunpowder plot conspirators terrorists of their time? You'll need to write a concluding judgment which answers that question and has a clear line of argument. Use evidence from the article that we're about to look at and from any other point in the lesson as well. So imagine that all of the information you've looked at so far during this lesson is the rest of your essay and then you're simply writing the concluding judgment. Please use detailed support and evidence um, to form your overall judgment. Okay, ready for the article. So... Guy Fawkes, was he a terrorist or a freedom fighter? Behind the bonfires, fireworks and funny effigies, there looms an enigmatic historical figure. How should we regard Guy Fawkes? So on the one hand, we could consider that he's a terrorist, and this is the information to support that. And there's probably information earlier on in the lesson that you could use as well. Here are the facts. In 1605, a Catholic fundamentalist called Guy Fawkes conspired with other fanatics to commit what would have been a massive terrorist outrage. He failed, and his story has become more of a thing of folklore than stone-cold history. When we think of Fox now, it's as a blundering buffoon, a cartoon character, or more absurdly, a heroic symbol of rebellion. That's only because his actions took place several centuries ago, and the buffer of time allows us to semi-forget the sheer brutality of his aims. He and his co-conspirators wanted to murder not only King James, but the whole of Parliament, it would have been an appalling massacre that would have left a vast crater in the heart of London. According to a modern day reconstruction of what a successful attack would have looked like, the explosion at Parliament would have killed everyone within a hundred metre radius and likely blown out windows in the surrounding area. The explosion would have been heard for miles around. As a terrorist atrocity striking at the heart of the nation, it would have dwarfed the events of 9-11. As writer Max Davidson puts it, as a terrorist atrocity striking at the heart of a nation, it would have dwarfed 9-11. Guy Fawkes would not have been a harmless bumbler, recreated in pillowcases stuffed with leaves and chucked on bonfires, but he would have been a hate figure to rival Osama bin Laden. Fawkes was the exact Jacobean equivalent of a homegrown Islamist terrorist today. He was motivated by his fanatical religious beliefs. He was a member of a persecuted minori minority, the Catholics of England, who nevertheless were overwhelmingly faithful to their country, with only a tiny minority of extremists sharing Fawkes' beliefs. Heavyweight historian Dr David Starkey leaves us in no doubt as to the true nature of Guy Fawkes and his secret associates. So this is what David Starkey has to say and you could use this as evidence in your line of argument or in your conclusion. The parallels between the actions of the plotters and modern day terrorists are terrifying and the motivation is the same that religion is the only important thing and that if the government does not subscribe to the idea that your religion is absolute then the government must be removed and that ultimately is what drove guy fawkes a single-minded dedicated to a rational uh, radical cause with human beings as collateral damage his obsessive desires and dark-hearted lack of pity made him such as much of a terrorist sorry, as anyone striking fear on the world stage today. So obviously that's suggesting he's a terrorist and that we should remember him as such. Okay, Now let's have a look at him as a freedom fighter. Freedom fighter. So this question takes us back to that old cliche about how one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. But in the case of Guy Fawkes, the details are important in defining the man. 
Yes, he helped orchestrate a plot that would have killed people, but it was all a far cry from acts such as 9-11 or the London 7-7 bombings. Before we get to that, let's just emphasise how dire the situation was for Catholics at that time. Under Elizabeth I, Catholics had been systematically ostracised, victimised and brutalised. So they'd been punished, um, they'd been treated badly and they'd been sort of pushed to the outer limits of society. No one really wanted anything to do with them. Some houses even had to have priest halls, so areas where desperate outlaw clerics um, or priests hid from murderous agents of the state in a manner Anne Frank would have recognised. Okay, so they were forced to go into hiding, basically. When James I came to power, Catholics felt a shy blossoming of optimism. The new king, while being a Protestant, also happened to be the son of a Catholic, and he had made conciliatory noises which seemed to imply a relaxing of the rules against Catholics practising their faith. Now that's interesting because Anne of Denmark, his wife, um, we believe converted to Catholicism at some point and was a um, practising Catholic, and I think that worried Parliament quite a lot. Bonfires are a traditional symbol of Guy Fawkes Night in Britain. Such hope was short-lived. Despite those early signs, James I soon cracked down hard on the rival religion, even pronouncing his utter detestation of Catholicism. It's no, wonderful, no wonder people like Guy Fawkes felt bitter and betrayed. The continuation of Elizabeth's iron rod attitude was the final straw for some people, who were right to feel crushed by their own government none of which can ever justify a plot to murder people, but the context is important for defining Fawkes as a person. He was a freedom fighter insofar as he was literally fighting for his freedom, and his target is important as well. The major thing differentiating Fawkes and his accomplices from terrorists as we know them today, is that they did not target civilians. So they didn't target people who were not involved in the situation. The aim was to wipe out the elite people at the top of England's power structure, not members of the public. This is a crucial thing to bear in mind. In addition, their aim was not to inspire terror or fear. They didn't intend to simply set off an explosion and skulk off into the shadows in the way terrorists do. They wanted to replace the king um, with his own daughter Elizabeth and create a new government overnight. In other words, this wasn't a failed act of terrorism so much as it was a failed military coup. Once you factor these things in, it must surely be agreed that Guy Fawkes cannot be defined as a terrorist in the way we understand the term today. What do you think? Should we consider Guy Fawkes and his co-conspirators as vicious terrorists or wrong-minded freedom fighters? And do such distinctions matter anyway? Okay, so now it's your opportunity to answer that question. Um which you might need to rewind and make sure you've got it written down to write a concluding judgment as to whether you think Guy Fawkes and the other men involved were terrorists or freedom fighters. Use evidence from the article, remember, and evidence from the rest of the lesson that we've looked at as well. Okay. Now, finally, I just want to show you one last slide. Beyond this lesson, okay, so hopefully you've enjoyed all if not at least some of today's lesson if you're particularly interested in this topic and this was something that was mentioned or alluded to in the article there is a modern day reconstruction of the gunpowder plot and what would have happened essentially so would it have been successful would it have blown up the houses of parliament and its occupants if you type the following into youtube the gunpowder plot guy fawkes documentary real truth science a documentary will come up um, which is sort of inspired by or covered by Richard Hammond um, and it is really quite interesting so if you want to watch that feel free to I'm not saying you have to okay I hope you've enjoyed this lesson and I'll see you again next week with a lesson on Charles the first until then happy historying
year seven and it should go without saying and i have already kind of mentioned this always be careful with fireworks and fire in general really dangerous stuff okay keep safe speak soon bye